We have a group that is leaving for a trip to Europe uh, this week. And if I could have all those going on that trip to come up, we'd like to have a, a prayer uh, for these folks before they leave this week. They are uh, traveling throughout Europe, and uh, one of their stops that uh, I, I think is really the highlight of the trip is they will stop and see our missionaries, Jean and Suzanne Ferreau, in Belgium. And so uh, this is a great opportunity. If I could have all who are going to Europe to come up to stand with me, please. Uh, good job, Michaela. Uh, but this is a great opportunity for us to get our people, uh, when you're where our missionaries are, it is a special, special thing for us to encourage them, see them. And so uh, they are doing that this week. So I wanted us to, for you to see them. Greg Foster is organizing this trip. They'll meet up with him. And uh, we want to be praying for them, but in a special way. Let's pause right now and lift them up to God. God, we uh, just ask that you would bless uh, these uh, of our number who are going to Europe. Uh, this trip that they will be taking, we pray for their safety. We pray uh, in a special way that as they uh, stop uh, and see our missionaries and those who are serving in your kingdom in Europe, that in a special way they will be an encouragement uh, to those servants and that they, that our people will be encouraged and come back and uh, tell of your works uh, halfway around the globe. And so we pray your greatest blessing on, on these, uh, these people and their trip. And we pray it in our Savior's name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. As was uh, mentioned, we have a holiday that... <coughs> Memorial Day that our, our people celebrate as a culture. It's special to us, I think, as Christians. Uh, in particular, those willing to lay their life down for our freedoms. And the greatest freedom I know that we enjoy is a day just like this. We can come without harassment, without persecution, and we can freely worship. Amen. And that is a blessing to us. And it's also a responsibility to us because with that type of freedom, think how much greater we can spread the gospel. Uh, we're not restricted. And so we want, we want to do that more and more, but uh, we're very grateful today for, uh, for those who've protected us and served and laid down their lives for us and our freedoms. Uh, of course, VBS meeting, uh, you know, if you didn't hear before, there'll be a meeting immediately after services today. We're two weeks out. Uh, if you don't know what your VBS assignment is, uh, please come to this meeting. Help us. This is a great time to get organized. Uh, we don't want to. We don't want to come, you know, the day of or the night of VBS and try to get it organized. Then we want to do it now. So uh, we'll have a brief meeting for that after services today. So uh, stay for that if, if, if that fits you. We started a series last week, uh, Save Yourselves, and uh, we looked at Paul's conversion, the Apostle Paul. Scripture gives us uh, numerous details and information about the, the greatest thing that we have, the greatest need we have is salvation. And the Bible tells us how to do that. But not only does Scripture tell us how to be saved, it shows us how. And the conversion of Paul is a great example. We looked at that last week. And I'd like us to just reflect back briefly and then we'll go uh, even deeper this morning. But in Acts chapter 9, <clears throat> and uh, as was mentioned last week in the book of Acts, we see, we read about Paul's conversion really three different times. Uh, the first time when it's recorded in Acts 9 and then Paul retells of his conversion in Acts 22 and in Acts 26. And so all of those help give us uh, more and more details. But Acts 9, 4, this is where Paul's on the road to Damascus. Uh, Paul is against Christianity. He thought Christ was a fraud. And so he's on his way to persecute Christians. But that's when God, Jesus, speaks to him from heaven, says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul doesn't know, you know, who's talking to me? Who, who are you, Lord? He says, the answer is, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. And the chapter 22 account tells us at this point, Paul says, what shall I do? Pretty, pretty good question. Pretty good response. Uh, Paul asks the question that we need to ask. God, what do you want from me? What shall I do, Lord? And Jesus tells him, you go into Damascus, it'll be told you what to do. And so he does, and we see that he, in Damascus, he's blinded by that light. So he's blind, and he does not eat or drink for three days. He's also praying during this time. 
Uh, and that makes perfect sense. I would be too. Wouldn't you? You realize you've been going the wrong way. You've been, you thought you were helping God and you, were, you realize now you were hurting God. And you've been struck down, so to speak. And you're in deep sorrow. Paul is fasting. Uh, he's in his sins. Paul is lost. He doesn't know up from down. And he's waiting to be told. And uh, that answer comes in Acts 9.18. This is when Ananias comes to him. And Ananias, uh, his sight is restored by God. But then in verse 18, he rose and was baptized. And taking food, he was strengthened. Now that's an odd order unless we understand baptism. If baptism is something that is good and right to do, but I'm saved before, and I'm Paul, don't let's not let's eat, okay? If I'm saved, let's talk about that. Tell me I'm saved. Uh, let's celebrate that. Hallelujah! Praise God. And I'm starving, by the way, right? Don't if I'm saved, don't come to me if I hadn't eaten in three days and let, and do something that can wait. Don't come to me and say, Elliot, we'd like to take a, we need you to go, go over here and let's take a picture for the church directory. Could you do that? I would say, no, thank you. I'm hungry. Can we eat and celebrate, celebrate, you know, me being a Christian and can we do that later? Can we schedule that sometime? But that's not what Paul does. He is baptized. And we see why he's baptized in the Acts 22 account because Ananias told him, we don't need to wait on this. Ananias says, what are, you, what are you waiting for? That, that tells us, Ananias has been telling Paul about baptism. Paul, we, we've been, he knows about it, has to. And Ananias says, what are we waiting for? Wash your sins away, call in on his name. By the way, why do you call on God's name if you're already saved? And the answer is, this is the point of, baptism is the point of salvation. I go down a sinner, I come up a saint, I'm calling on God to save me. And that's what we see happens here. We also noticed last week uh, um, in Luke chapter 24, these are some of Jesus' last words. This is after he's died, been buried, risen again. He's about to go to heaven and leave the apostles. And he tells them, it's been prophesied, that repentance and forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed. And we see in Acts chapter 2, this is only days later, day of Pentecost. People from every nation are in Jerusalem celebrating this holiday. Peter and the other apostles preach to the crowd. The crowd is convicted of their sins and they ask Peter, same thing Paul asked, they say, what should we do? Peter, what should we do? And Peter tells them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. So just what Jesus predicted would be preached, was preached, and baptism is a part of that. Baptism is in the midst of that. Peter preaches on, by the way, to this crowd. He tells them what to do, and then he keeps talking, and he says, he makes a statement, verse 40, save yourselves. It's kind of a, it's a, it's a little bit of an odd title, right? Because we know God saves us. You can't save you. You don't have that power, but God does but Peter uses those words because they accurately convey the fact that we have to do something. We, God wants us to be saved, but the ball's in our court. And if we respond, God will save us, but we have to do something. We have to respond. So Peter is telling them this, save yourselves. In verse 41, those who received his word, those who said, all right, I'm in. What did they do? They were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Who added, by the way? And if you look down in your Bible at verse 47, we see the Lord added day by day those being saved. God adds. Sometimes uh, it can be confusing when new folks come to us. They want to be a part of us. And, and I love that. That's what we want. We want to draw people, right, to Christ. Be a part of this family. And they want to, and we want them to, but they don't know, and they will ask, how do I join this church? And that's, that's an understandable question. Our stance on that is this. God adds people to the church. Yeah. Acts 2.47. God has that authority and power. And we don't. We don't decide salvation. We don't decide who's added to God's kingdom. He does. Our, we're just stewards. And all we can do is take this book right here. 
And we can look in it and see what it says to be added and what people did to be added. And that's how we handle it. We take each person and try to help them. If they've done as Scripture teaches, God, then God has added you. And if, you, if there's something missing and we do that, we, God will add you. And when God does that, you're in His kingdom. And, and, and that's how that works. That's what's important to us, that you're in God's kingdom. That you, your name is in the book of life. And so we're very convicted about that. And please understand, we're very convicted because we want every soul to be on the path to heaven according to God's word, doing it His way, by the book. We want that because we're in the business of helping people to be saved, right? We're not just adding numbers to add numbers. We're trying to add souls. But God's the boss and we try to do it His way every step. Uh, last week we looked at this scripture and I would say that this, uh, these two verses are a major point of confusion in the Christian world today. And I would, I would also, you know, on the topic of confusion, if, if you want to be confused about something, I mean, if we're going to be confused about something, let it be something else. Let it be uh, confused if we live in a republic or a democracy. Okay, let's be confused about that. I mean, if we're going to be confused about something, uh, let it not be salvation is my point. Yesterday at my house, we had, I, I heard a call, I was in one room and I heard a call that said, uh, do you have, it was from Stephanie, she said, do you have your shoes on? That's all I heard. And then I didn't hear anything else, but no, I don't have my shoes on. I figured, it's, you know, she's needing somebody to go outside and get something. Who has their shoes on? It was confusing to me. But then it dawned on me, maybe something's going on. So I get up, sure enough, now I find out there's a snake. We found a snake. A snake outside. All right. I got my shoes on. So, and I have to tell you, I'm so, so proud of my wife. By the time I got outside, she'd already killed this snake. Yes. Yes. I'm sorry. Uh, but God has given us dominion over the animal kingdom for good reason. And at my house, if you're a snake, you've come to the wrong house. Good, bad, or other. So, after it's killed, then we identify it. And you may be sorry to know that it was a harmless garter snake. When it's your time to go, it's your time to go. Um, my point is, if you're going to be confused about something, be confused about what kind of snake something is, right? I say kill it and then figure out, but you could do it different. Uh, be confused about which Kardashian is pregnant, all right? But don't be confused about how to be saved. And that's why Scripture can be confusing, but God never intended it to be. Okay, And that's why this topic, why do we talk so much about baptism or salvation? Well, it's about the most important topic we can discuss, how to be saved. I want to get that right, by the way. If I get something else wrong, okay. Something else in my life that's trivial. But let it not be this. Alright, so let's look at this again. For by grace you have been saved. Through faith, this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Now, the point of confusion is when, when some read verse 9, not a result of works, they then take us uh, what is, I, I would admit, somewhat logical thought process to, well, baptism sure looks like a work. And if I'm not saved by works, therefore I must not be saved by baptism, therefore I must be saved before. Okay? So there's, the, there's the, the take that becomes confusing. But I would have you, let's back up a minute. We need to understand the point that Paul's making here, by the way. And he says, verse 8, it's by grace you've been saved through faith. Faith is a part of it and things that go with faith. It's not your own doing. Now, if we stop there, we kind of have a problem because faith is my own doing. <clears throat> Repentance is my own doing. Baptism is definitely my own doing. But even if we just talk about faith and repentance, th those are my own doing. Those are me. That's what I do. Paul goes on. He says, it's the gift of God. By the way, that's the point of this verse. It's the gift of God. Not a result of works. 
We're talking to, Paul is, is talking uh, to people that Jews had a long history of righteousness, of a belief that righteousness was from works, obeying the old law. They obeyed the old law meticulously, right? Uh, they micromanaged it. They legalized it. They, uh, they went way too far with it, trying to find righteousness through works. But that's not where works are found. By the way, this, this statement, not your own doing, the NIV says, not from yourselves. New American and King James says, not of yourselves. Paul is saying that when you're saved, you didn't do it. We can't save ourselves. We can't be good enough, and we can't do good enough, and we can't sacrifice enough, and we can't believe enough, and we can't repent enough. There's no enough we can do, right? To take it. It has to be given to us. Uh, when I, uh, a few years ago, obtained a degree from a <clears throat> university in Stillwater. <laughs> as, a, as a gift. Yes. There you go. Uh, my father gave me a gift. And uh, the gift was his class ring from when he graduated Oklahoma Christian. And that's, of course, special to me. When I, when I graduated Oklahoma Christian, uh, rings were expensive, didn't have the money for one, never got one. And uh, so Dad gave me that as a graduation gift uh, when I finished that degree from OSU. I, I have uh, no doubt that had I not obtained that degree, that wouldn't have triggered his thought or... Uh, the occasion to give me a gift, right? And yet, the gift is a hundred percent gift. I didn't earn part of this ring because I because of a degree I got. Makes sense. So when Scripture says it's by grace you've been saved, that doesn't negate scriptures like these that say if you confess. Here's an if then statement: If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. By the way, we do that when anytime I baptize someone, I ask them, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died for your sins? Um, are you ready to make him Lord of your life? Scripture says if you confess Jesus is Lord. If you confess him before men, he'll confess us before the Father. It doesn't negate a scripture that says, why do you wait? Rise, be baptized, wash your sins away, calling on his name. Or, unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Or, when Jesus said, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. This Ephesians passage doesn't cancel out these others, right? Because the point of the Ephesians passage is not that you don't have to do anything. It's that what you do doesn't earn you salvation. It is a gift. G-I-F-T. Gift. 100%. Let's look on. Let's go further. We have, uh, and by the way, the point of that, we don't have room to boast. We're not arrogant Christians. We're not self-righteous Christians. We never can be. We have no reason to be, right? Our salvation is a gift from God, not because we were good enough. All right. We have verses. There are four of them, by the way. Verses with baptism and salvation in the same verse. And we've looked at some of these already. Mark 16, 16, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Rise and be baptized and wash your sins away. Uh, baptism corresponds to this, now saves you. So we have four with the word baptism and a form of salvation, reference to salvation in the same verse. The reason that's helpful is it is on this point of confusion. Am I saved before baptism or at baptism? And we have four. One would be enough, by the way. Although one, you might, okay, maybe it, maybe it means this or that. But we have four. And in all four, baptism comes before salvation. Let's look at a few more. Uh, these are, uh, answer the question, how do we get into Christ? 1 Corinthians 12, 13. And this was our scripture reading today. It says, for in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews, Greeks, slaves are free, all made to drink of one spirit. We're baptized into the body of Christ. Galatians 
chapter 3, verse 27 says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And so baptism is where we put on our Savior. We put on Christ. We become a Christian. We wear that. Romans 6, 3, do you not know? All of us who have been baptized into Jesus were baptized into His death. Uh, let's back up just a minute. At, in Romans, this is a great passage. Chapter, uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 1 is making the point that we live under a new covenant. We're not under the old covenant, uh, the law of Moses. We don't offer sacrifices. We don't keep the Sabbath holy. Those are things of the old covenant. We're under a new covenant. And under the new covenant, we have forgiveness of sins through Jesus' blood. We have God's grace. And in verse 1 of Romans 6, Paul asked the question, Well, if when we sin, and of course that, that, uh, what goes with that is our repentance, but when we sin, if God's grace covers our sins, our forgiveness, in other words, once you become a Christian, you don't stop sinning, you try to, but you continue to fail periodically. God's grace covers that. Paul puts forth this question. Well, if God's grace covers it, and if I sin, it, it, however much I sin, if I'm penitent, God's grace covers it, then why not just keep sinning? Why not just, right? If we have God's grace to cover it, just it's kind of like speeding. If you, if you were not like me and you had money to cover speeding tickets, why not just speed? Right? If you can afford it, go ahead. I'm not saying to, I'm saying someone would. And Paul says, by no means. And that's where he comes to verse 3. Do you not know? This is about stop sinning, Christians, as much as you can. Do you not know all of us who are baptized into Christ, so into, you were baptized into His death. Now what's that about? Baptized into His death. We were buried with Him by baptism into death. So our bat, there's death involved in our baptism. At a baptism, if you've been at one, it is the only happy funeral you'll ever go to. Baptism, part of baptism is a funeral. We are buried with Him. All right? So baptism is immersion. It's symbolic, but there is something dying and we bury it symbolically in that water. What's dying? What's dying is the old person. So whoever's being, becoming a Christian in baptism... Whoever's doing that, their old person, they're saying, I want you to die. My old ways, my sinful ways, the selfish ways. I want that person to die. I'm changing. I want to live for Christ. And we bury that old person. And that's a funeral, right? Into death. And we celebrate it. In order that. It's a powerful statement. We read over it. We don't think about it. It's probably rarely highlighted. But I think those three words are so helpful on this topic. Here's the why. And, and that's a big question on baptism. If I'm saved before, then why am I being baptized? What's it for? And, and that's why so many scriptures direct us to the fact that we're saved at baptism. In order that. Why are we baptized? Well, we're, we're burying something. Why? In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Baptism is where we bury something and we come up to live a new life. It's, it's where we start over in Christ. Baptism, so in, in these three verses, we see that baptism is how you get into the body of Christ. It's how you put on Christ. It's done in order to start a new life. Add to that these that we've already looked at. It is for forgiveness of sins. It is to wash your sins away. It saves you. So my question now would be if God, assume with me for a minute, if God wanted us to be baptized and at that point our sins would be washed away and at that point we would be saved, if that is the truth, my question is what else would God have to say in Scripture to tell us that? If I struggle to believe that I'm saved at baptism, in other words, that baptism is where my sins are washed away. If I struggle to believe that, what else would God need to tell me in this book to tell me that's when I'm saved? Would He need to tell me it's for the forgiveness of my sins? Or would He need to tell me that it washes my sins away? 
Would he need to tell me to believe and do it and I'd be saved? Mark 16, 16. Would he need to tell me that it just plainly, God, tell me it saves me and I'll get it. 1 Peter 3, 21. And so this is a topic that we don't want to be confused about. We want to get this one. Uh, incidentally, next week we will get into some, some barriers, uh, some things that, that can get in our way or people struggle with. Uh, what about all the good people who have lived for Christ but didn't understand baptism like we're seeing? Uh, what about them? Uh, a person might have a barrier. I, I, I would like to be baptized. I'm not sure I can live the life that I believe a Christian should live. Someone might ask, what about the thief on the cross? I know he was not baptized. And Jesus said he would be in paradise. Uh, what if somebody's on their way to be baptized and they die? That, that doesn't make sense to me. Uh, we'll, also, we'll, we'll just go straight to John 3.16. What about that? Right? Just John 3.16. That it doesn't say baptism, so, so I'm still confused. We'll get into some more of that next week. Uh, we're going to sing a, a song this morning, Wonderful, Merciful Savior. And this topic reminds us, uh, our, this whole topic is about salvation. And, and baptism is just God, that's God's plan and His means. But uh, thank God we have a Savior, right? Amen. Our job is to spread that word. I encourage you to do that. I encourage you to live like you're saved. Uh, if you're not, if you... Have doubt if there's someone here this morning who has need uh, to come back to Christ or to put on Christ in baptism and have your sins washed away. We'd love nothing more than to help with someone. Uh, let us know as we stand and sing. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend, who lived on land, good, rescueless souls of men. Oh, you rescue the souls of men. You are the one that we pray. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace. Our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger for. Our way. You are the one that we pray.